<clears throat> now, let's start looking at Wordsworth and Blake. But not Blake, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge. A little bit of uh, context about <clears throat> Wordsworth and Blake. Where are we now in our time machine? We are moving forward a few years past Blake toward the turn of uh, <clears throat> the late 18th century, the early 19th century. So we're around circa 1800, a little bit before, a little bit after. Blake was still alive at this time, but he, he was mostly writing a little earlier in this. Okay, These cats start a revolution in poetry and a revolution in fiction and in writing in England with uh, a work of literature called Lyrical Ballads. This was uh, their most famous work. It was a book that was co-written by Coleridge and Wordsworth, these two cats that we're reading okay, this week. And uh, this established the Romantic era, era in literature. You see in this uh, little <clears throat> excerpt I have right here from <clears throat> some context on Wordsworth, it says he was at the forefront of the revolution in literature that took place when the neoclassicism of the 18th century gave rise to the romanticism of the early 19th. There were several major areas in which this change took place. So these are some of the ideas that this era is going to be emphasizing. Reestablish the importance of the imagination and the creative process. This was a lot like what Blake was talking about. The imagination is one of the more important aspects of creativity, not reason. <clears throat> In contrast to neoclassicism, which had exalted the rational intellect. So imagination, emotion versus reason. The power of the imagination gives the poet the ability to see the external world from a higher perspective, almost as if we are separated from the external world itself. We can be able to understand it better. It creates a unity and diversity. Remember when I talked about auguries of innocence in our online lecture, how I talked about to see the world in a grain of sand, hold eternity in a wildflower? <clears throat> that unity and diversity. And that doesn't just have to do with that grain of sand or that wild flower. It has to do with all people. Remember I talked about that poem, A Little Black Boy, how uh, <clears throat> Blake was talking about, no matter what color you are, we're all the same. In our souls, we're pure white. Uh, and so he, he tried to say that all the races were the same in a poem like that. He tried to make the argument that animals and humans were the same. We're all equal. <clears throat> and so these cats are going to emphasize something like that as well. Romantics also emphasize the importance of feeling and emotion and spontaneity of the creative act. <clears throat> so these are some of the things that this lyrical balance uh, that piece of writing that we're going to be reading a bunch of poetry from emphasizes. And there's lots of romantics uh, that you might read about in other classes like uh, Percy Shelley, John Keats, uh, <clears throat> like you might read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and stuff like that, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne in America. <clears throat> um, you might read stuff like that. Some of the things that Wordsworth wanted to write about that were kind of revolutionary at the time, he wrote about ordinary events in the lives of ordinary people. He liked to write about simple country folk and children, but also about social act outcasts and mis misfits. So this broke a lot of rules of poetry at the time. You, usually, poets at the time were writing about the smart man who sits in his corner like Descartes, pondering, you know, the mysteries of the universe, okay? Instead, poets like Wordsworth felt that the simple, the common people, children, had more to teach us about 
you know, eternal truths than did these ponderous old men sitting in their armchairs living a comfortable life. So he called this writing in the common language of men. It may seem to you like Wordsworth is writing in a really elevated language or like it might be kind of hard to read or understand. But in truth, this language kind of comes a lot more down to earth than did a lot of the poetry at the time. And it appropriates a lot of the language of the everyday common people. And that was, to some people, they just read it and they're like, this ain't poetry. Of course, they didn't say this ain't poetry. This is not poetry of the highest art. You know, <laughs> I'd say this ain't poetry. You know, and that would be more like what he would say. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so why am I emphasizing that? Because it helps us to kind of understand some of the key concepts that Wordsworth is illustrating in this here. And if anybody has any questions online, feel free to chime in. Same way here, right? So this is one of the first poems that I asked us to read. The world is too much with us. Oh, William Wordsworth. William Wordsworth. So let's try to connect some things to William Blake and what we're reading about from William Blake. Remember that I said that William Blake didn't like a lot of the aspects of our modern world. He felt that the, the aspects of the modern world living in this modern industrial culture kind of strips away our true nature. It takes us away from what we should really be like. It harms us. It corrupts us. And this poem is a lament about the ways in which modern society, not necessarily industrial society, but some of it is industrial society, which modern society <clears throat> kind of harms us. You see that from the very argument of the poem. The argument of the poem is this initial claim right here. The world is too much with us. So what does he mean by the world? He's talking about modern society. Think about whenever I read this poem, I think about, especially from this first line, the world is too much with us, late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our power. I think about having to go to work, having to go to class, having to be on time. If you're late, you get punished, you're tardy, okay? Uh, <clears throat> getting and spending, we're focused on buying that new house, paying off our student loans. We're focused on all of these aspects of money and stuff like that. These things, focusing on these things, which actually aren't in nature, lay waste our powers. They make us weak. How many of us thrown into the wilderness <clears throat> without modern conveniences could last very long? You know? Uh, I would say five years ago, I couldn't last very long, but recently I've, you know, going out into the woods, I've learned, my, my daughter's a Cub Scout, I've learned how to make a fire, I learned how to, you know, read topographical maps, how to find my way with a compass, I've learned to identify venomous versus non-venomous snakes and, you know, stuff like that. I've, you know, I can live just pretty much anywhere now, but it took a lot of work. Like I had to separate myself from what I was used to. We lay laced our powers. We lose some of those powers of perception that we might have in the state of nature. Think about Native Americans, you know, and all the different ways in which I was reading today. Uh, I follow some snake forums online. Uh, and I was reading today about copperheads and how they're attracted to places that have cicadas. Okay, and so the Indians, when the colonists came over, they gave them this bit of information. You should not go outside when the cicadas are out really strong because copperheads love to come and eat cicadas. So don't go outside at night when they're going on. You're likely to step on a copperhead. Okay, <clears throat> that's a, something, something that they learned from being outside, from perceiving that. They lived outside all the time as opposed to a lot of the English settlers who are always living inside. So we're laying waste our powers. 
Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. So looking at this right here, we don't see much in nature that we truly can identify with. Freedom is one thing, like freedom from these things right here. That is something that could be ours in nature, but we can't identify with it. We're constantly caught in the struggle of life. We have given our hearts away. So Wordsworth feels that our hearts, our true hearts, our uncorrupted hearts can be found in the natural things. This is getting in my way on a trip. Another way to look at this is that, think about some of the Blake poems and the chimney switches and stuff like that. The society wasn't, was using other people, using little children to do things just so they could have modern conveniences like warmth uh, you know, through coal. Using other people to have that. So we've given our hearts away. They weren't even worried about these little kids, okay? They were more focused on, you know, having their day to day conveniences and not thinking about others. So this is one of the ways that Wordsworth might argue people are giving their hearts away. He says the sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours are all gathered now like sleeping flowers. So he's talking about all the natural scenery that we've abandoned that we don't take note of anymore. Instead, you know, people sailing on a cruise ship might go inside and not enjoy that kind of thing. They might just sit there getting drunk at a piano bar uh, and not even paying attention to the howling winds outside. They're upgathered now like sleeping flowers. That's a neat little image right there. It says that nature is there. It's something that could open up and bloom and blossom for us if we would just sit there and look at it. it would teach us something. For this, for everything, we're out of tune. It moves us not. This poem's a great lament. And <clears throat> there's a turn in this poem. Most poems have a turn at some point. They make an argument, they prove that argument, and then they have what's called a turn. And here we have the turn, the shift in the poem. When he says, great God, he's got this, he feels obviously a lot of emotion, and he lets that emotion come out which is, you know, pretty distinctive of romantic poetry. I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So he'd rather be a pagan than a Christian because paganism emphasized the earth. It emphasized love of the earth. And he talks about these pagan gods and a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lay, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight, Proteus, the old man of the sea, this Greek mythology, he's referring to Greek mythology, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. So he contrasts the old gods versus the new in Game of Thrones, you know, kind of reference. He contrasts the old gods versus the new, and he says, look, back in the day, they used to see life in nature. They used to see the power and majesty in nature, and he laments that we can't see these things anymore. Okay. Where did I go? Here we are. Now, since, you know, we don't want to stay down all the time, let's take a look at something a little more joyful, okay? I read this poem to my daughter the other day when we were sitting outside having our breakfast. Well, and so it was a really nice uh, <clears throat> weekend. I had her this weekend and she loves you know, nature, which is something that I've you know, kind of communicated to her. We went out to Choctaw Lake, swam in the lake. It was nice, beautiful day. Uh, <clears throat> but it started off with reading this poem right here. In this poem, like a lot of romantic poetry, it starts out with natural imagery. And from that natural imagery, the poet learns something. The poet discovers something, 
about himself and about the rest of us, just as in the last one. This one's more joyful than the last. So the speaker of the poem says, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or veils and hills, so valleys and hills. Imagine him like a cloud floating high above valleys and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, so we expect he's going to see a lot of people, right? No, he sees a host of golden daffodils to the side of the lake beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze. So you've heard that phrase, all who wonder are not lost. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> in that phrase, you might think he's wondering, he's lonely, but where does he find a cure to his loneliness in nature? So a message might be, if you ever feel lonely, if you ever feel like you can't find yourself, you can in nature. Natural scenery is somewhere that you can find company. And that company, look at how it's characterized. It's fluttering and dancing. So nature is alive. <clears throat> Another term, like look at word choice, golden daffodils. So he says, if not in that word right there, golden has a connotation to money, right? Nature can be as worthwhile as gold, money. You can find something just as valuable as money or more valuable, you would say, in nature itself. These daffodils are playful as well. Nature is playful, and Wordsworth loves the playful attitude like a child has a playful attitude. Continuous as the stars that shine. He's talking about the daffodils, like they're eternal. Okay, so he finds the eternal in nature, and that's going to be a theme throughout Wordsworth's work. You can find the eternal in nature, even though we die, even though we're going to get older and pass away, even though the daffodils die. They seem as if they're eternal, and they're as eternal as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. They stretched in never-ending lines, so there's infinity in nature. Along the margin of a bay, 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not be gay in such a jocund company. So nature, if you're out in nature and you're able to experience all these things, it can provide you joy. Natural scenery can provide you joy. Keep in mind that in contrast to what we were talking about what it's like to live inside of London at the time, the modern city. Remember I talked about with Blake, it's covered in soot. It's uh, the sky is black with, you know, coal burning. It's a dark, bleak, dreary place. But out here, there's happiness, there's freedom. It's almost magical, it's brightly dancing. I gazed and I gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. Now, this is a key aspect of Wordsworth's philosophy overall in all of his poems. <clears throat> so this is what I wrote right here. Poetry is written in recollection of emotion, in recollection of an overflow of spontaneous emotions. That's a, a key quote from Wordsworth right there. Poetry or emerges from the recollection of an overflow of spontaneous emotions. So he didn't think about how wonderful this was at the or what it could teach him at the moment. Okay? He thought about it later, and that's where we get to the turn in the poem. For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood. So now we're now he's on his couch, chilling, thinking by himself in a vacant or pensive mood. These images of nature, of the daffodils, happy and free, these images of freedom flash upon my inward eye, his mind, which is the bliss of solitude. So that's where he finds happiness and loneliness. He finds happiness and loneliness when he's sitting there on his couch, thinking back all on these beautiful memories that he had. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodil. So some of the ways that I related 
you know, in second level analysis to my daughter when I was talking about this before. I talked about she has a lot of anxiety when she faces tests, for instance, time tests, for instance. Okay. I know that's more of a thing with school nowadays than it used to be, perhaps. And so I said, well, when you face these kinds of things, this poem seems to say, if you face anxiety, if you face loneliness, if you face these negative feelings of this human world, you can think about your happy place. For Wordsworth, his happy place was dance, was thinking about these daffodils by a lake, by a stream. For Brooklyn, her happy place is on the beach, dealing with her family. For me, my happy place is way up in the mountains, far away from people, on top of a waterfall. Okay? That's my happy place. What's your happy place? Anybody? Grandparents' farm? Favorite thing at your grandparents' farm? Oh, yeah. Uh, I wish I knew how to fish. I'm still learning. That's one of those things I'm still learning how to do. I'm very bad at it. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. That's why I went to the beach in May this year instead of July. Anybody else? Doesn't have to be nature. Your room? Yeah? Is there a reason, like something in your room that's special to you? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah? Oh, yeah, you don't have to talk to anybody. You don't have to worry about the cares of the rest of the world. I get you. Anybody online? We got Landry says hers is the mountains by a waterfall. Kennedy says her great grandmother's house when she cooks, especially. Austin says driving and listening to music. People love um, the beach at nighttime. Oh, I'm sorry, everybody. I I'm online. I'm not showing uh, my. Uh, here is my I wandered lonely as a cloud. Right here. Sorry about that, online folks. So that's one of the messages of this poem. If you're doing second level analysis, you could connect in the way that y'all are doing. You might say a specific place, and even better would be a specific memory. And even better would be to explain why that memory was so important to you. Like, Bailey, you were talking about your the pond, you know, like if your would you say your grandfather's house? Okay. Yeah. So maybe if your grandfather taught you how to fish and that was like one of your most precious moments with him. I'm just brainstorming. Something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she beat her brother and she was happy about that. So it, it, this moment of competition, this moment of pure joy in, in childhood, this is a moment that connects her with this poem right here. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to move from this poem to perhaps a little more difficult poem. Actually, before I get to that one, why don't I go to... Um, This poem first, composed upon Westminster Bridge, September the 3rd, 1802. Okay, <clears throat> now, a lot of Wordsworth's poems that he wrote feature a particular time, a particular place, okay? Emphasizing again, individuality, okay? Saying that one moment, is something that can help us to experience the eternal. Wordsworth felt that by looking at any individual thing, by looking at a grain of sand, like Blake says, we can find the eternal, something that teaches us something eternal. So a lot of his poems just mention a particular place in a particular time where he felt something 
that was in eternal truth. Here on Westminster Bridge on September the 3rd, 1802, William Wordsworth felt something that was eternal and timeless. Looking out upon this bridge. Now, if you've never been to London, you might need to know what that Westminster Bridge looks like. Uh, and so I shared in our forum a picture of what it might look like at the time. This is in our um, Forge and Wordsworth thing. It's kind of dark up in here, one of these clouds, stuff like that. People, lots of people in boats. There's a giant church right there. So imagine being on top of that. He's sitting out on this bridge. And it's the morning. That's another thing you need to know. First thing in the morning, dawn. Next thing you need to know is like what it might be like sitting on that bridge in the morning. So London is one of the busiest, one of the most populous cities in the world at the time. We've already seen in Blake's rendition of London, you know, how awful it could be. There's a lot of corruption, how gross and dirty and physically disgusting it can be. You remember from the other poems that we read that Coleridge really loves the outdoors. He loves nature. Uh, he thinks that modern society has torn us away from these things that can teach us something about ourselves. This poem is striking for a lot of reasons. First off is that we're not in nature. We are, I guess we technically are, but you know, we're more in a city, okay, in a modern setting. And he's looking out, and this is a really striking line right here, if you know much about Wordsworth. Earth has not, has not anything to show more fair than this city right now that I'm looking at. There's nothing in the world more fair, more beautiful than this city right now. Dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty, the city. He's making the argument that what he is looking at right now is a truly beautiful sight. Nothing is more beautiful than this. It's a sight so touching in its majesty. This city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. Right, so he starts to explain. Like I said, a poem, to understand how a poem works, a poem usually makes an argument in the opening stanzas. This is its argument, and it proves that argument with examples. And then he'll have a turn at some point. All right. So its first example to prove that is the city doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning. This is one reason why the city is so beautiful, because it, like a garment, wears the beauty of the morning. So a natural thing. The sun is shining down and touching the city. And because it's wearing the sun, the city is wearing the sun. That's one reason why it's beautiful. Okay. Another reason it's beautiful is because it's silent. London was rarely silent. It was bare, stripped bare. You can see it almost as if it's not trying to hide anything. Another reason it's beautiful is because its ships, its towers, its domes, its theaters, its temples lie open to the fields, to the sky. So it's opening itself to the beauties of nature at this very moment because it's dawn. Nobody, everybody's still asleep, okay? It's all bright and glittering in the smokeless air. People haven't woke up. They haven't started their chimneys. The factories haven't started yet. The air is smokeless. There's no smog. Never did the sun more beautifully steep in its first splendor a valley, a rock, or a hill. And again, contrast that with the natural scenery and Wordsworth's responses in some of the poems that we read. There's no other moment in nature that he can find that's more beautiful than this. 
Never saw I, I never felt a calm so deep. We're still wondering, why is it after all you've said about the beauty of nature, that this particular city, at this particular moment, is so much more beautiful? Why do you feel calm in this moment more than actually out in nature? Even the river glide, glideth at its own sweet will. So the river is free. Remember that from each chartered street and the chartered Thames from the Blake poem? That's the same river right there. Uh, the river is chartered. It's like it's being guided by man in that Blake poem, London. But here it says it's free because people aren't controlling it at this moment. Dear God, the very houses seem asleep. And all that mighty heart of London is lying still. So that word there, still, what happens when a heart is still? It's dead. Exactly. That's why he's happy. Because the city's dead. It's like the apocalypse happened. <laughs> and, you know, the city is dead. That's why he's so happy. It's the only time he can really enjoy London is when that mighty beady, beating heart of the modern industrial city is lying dead. It provides him a great sense of calm. <clears throat> this is when the city has its most beauty, and that's in contrast to what most people would say. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody want to add anything? Mm. So Michaela's bringing up something that I wrote at the bottom of the poem. <clears throat> the power of a moment. One moment can change you. Imagine Wordsworth waking up in the morning full of dread facing the day. God, I don't want to go to work, especially, you know, when COVID or whatever is around, you know, I'm scared, I'm afraid. All these people, my boss is breathing down my neck. My teacher is saying the assignment was due yesterday. And he looks out and he sees this right here. He says, all that crap doesn't matter in this one moment. And if I carry that one moment with me, like he did, and I wondered, loneliest cloud, I can be set free from this care, which doesn't actually matter. The birds don't freaking care what we're doing. I saw a beautiful cardinal this morning. She wasn't going to work at school. She was a he. <clears throat> you know, um, <clears throat> heard birds chirping out there this morning. They seem happy to me. You know, uh, they weren't worried about getting prepared for a lecture. Same kind of thing here. Okay. <clears throat> now let's move on to another poem by Wordsworth. Zooming back in time. <clears throat> Zooming back in time a little bit. The last one was 1802. This one's 1798. I'm probably not going to be able to cover all of this poem right now. But I think it's one of the poems that kind of cap off some of the things that I've been saying. This poem is one of the longer poems that we're reading. Like I said, usually a longer poem, you got more to write about. So it's easier to write about to me uh, to get a better grade because you got more to write about. <clears throat> you can compare and contrast a couple poems. If you take a look at the discussion forum that I posted for Coleridge and Wordsworth, I believe it's due on Friday. Uh, this one, uh, this discussion form says, pick two poems from the poets. And this is one of the poems you can write about. Let me see how much time we have. About, so this class ends at 10 o'clock. I don't want to, last time I went over a little bit because I'm just confused about the weird times things are meeting. So I might not be able to go really deeply in this poem. I think what I'm going to do is to kind of anticipate 
as y'all are reading these poems to kind of tell you the basic essentials you need in order to understand what's going on in the poem. Uh, and then I'm going to walk you through Frost at Midnight, and you'll see that's on the quiz as well. Uh, and Ode Intimations of Immortality is on the quiz as well. I'm going to walk you through those three poems real briefly and tell you something, some things that will help you to understand those poems as you're reading for Wednesday, okay? This poem is most commonly known as Tintern Abbey. It's one of his most famous poems. And I have another picture here. I don't know why it's not showing. It's a broken link. It's not loading. <clears throat> Might have to load that in a different browser, but I'm running out of time. I'll explain. I was able to see that on my uh, laptop this morning, but I'll explain what it looks like. Tintern Abbey is a church, okay? And in the time of Wordsworth, it was abandoned, okay? It was overgrown with weeds, roof had collapsed, all this stuff. There's all this natural scenery taking over this church. And just like Blake, Wordsworth, and Coleridge kind of had a distaste for the modern church, organized religion, even though they were very spiritual, you know, and that they, they thought they were Christians. Uh, Coleridge was a preacher, even, uh, but not, you know, not in the in vogue sense of what, you know, preaching or religion is, okay? So that's where we start. He's sitting here and he's looking at this beautiful scenery, nature taking over a church. Imagine the symbolic implications of that right there. It's like nature has taken over man's religion and we're going back to a more natural religion, more natural state of things where we can see God's unadorned message to us, where we can get the message ourselves instead of somebody up here saying, this is the true message of the word of the Lord. We get it from ourselves by looking out there. The basic situation of this poem is he was here five years ago in 1793. See that from the first few lines. Another thing you need to know is that he's sitting at this place, gazing at this abbey, and his sister is there with him, his younger sister, his dear, beloved sister. Okay, He's talking to her. You need to know these things in order to understand what the heck is going on. And he's talking about what that experience of seeing that abbey was like for him in the past. He's like this joyful, exuberant youth going around having a good time, but he's not realizing the message that this place is trying to communicate to him, the eternal truth. Now he's here five years later and he's starting to reckon, he's starting to realize how important this place was to him because for the five years, as they go forward, every time he faces anxiety or problems and stuff like that, he remembers. Like when, when I wandered lonely as a cloud, he remembers this natural scenery and how much it meant to him. And he communicates that to his sister <clears throat> as we go along. He addresses his sister. See, right here. Dear, dear sister, in this upper, and he says, I hope for you the same thing. Five years later, you come back to this place and it has the same experiences for you. Listen to the lessons that nature can teach you. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll talk about that poem further next time. A um, couple of other poems just to give you an understanding of what you need to know in order to understand what the heck is going on in those poems. Uh, one of the more important poems is Frost at Midnight by Coleridge, who was co-writing that lyrical ballads. This poem, we have a father, Coleridge, it is the poet, who is sitting in a cottage out in the country, and he's got his little newborn baby right here. 
sleep. He's a newborn son. He's sitting out in nature. He's feeling depressed. It's winter time at midnight. And he starts thinking about nature and all of these things. And he starts feeling better. And he remembers a time in his past when he was stuck in school and he hated it. And how did he get out of that? By daydreaming, by using the power of the imagination. That's what we're seeing right here. And then he looks back to his son and he starts addressing his son, his little baby. And he says, I hope that you, now I've moved out into the country. I hope that you will have a better teacher than I did in school, have a better teacher in nature. So we see his hopes and dreams for his kid in this poem right here. And another poem that's going to be important is Ode, Intimations of Immortality. Now, this poem I'm setting in contrast to the other poems that we read by Wordsworth, mainly because it's written by him at a later point in his life. Wordsworth gradually became disillusioned with what he was writing about. He felt like he was confused, morally confused and things like that. He didn't feel like he was as good a poet as he was back in the day as he grew older. This poem is one of his most famous poems from later in his life. And you see this argument right here. The child is the father of the man. So he's looking back on his past and he's trying, he's lamenting the fact that he is not seeing the vision of nature. Nature is not teaching him the way that it used to be. He's caught up in grief, sadness, that he's going to die soon. So, but he remembers his youthful exuberance. He remembers his child, and this helps him through a lot of problems. That's one of the key things going on in this poem right here. Okay, I'm running out of time, but just to make sure we're all on the same page for tomorrow, uh, you can see the announcements.